Chapter 16 It is a normal day in Drell. The ground is somewhat moist from a bit of rain through the night. The birds are chirping and playing on the buildings, like the shacks and lone fences made of wood. This tiny village is gathered for a wedding. Princess Mirasami and Renault are getting married and all villagers are there, in a grove with a patch of trees and a natural garden in between, and in the middle of it there is gathered all the villagers and, and the two to be wed. They gaze into each other's eyes lovingly, Mirasami smiling and Renault respectful and loving. Do you take each other in loving grace to forever be wed, in bad times and in good, to the end of your days? The two giggle, and Renault rubs his hair and says, I most certainly do, letting out a sigh, and then a smile. Mirasami says, I do. The feral priest then chants a prayer over the two and says, Kiss, so that you may be sealed together in love and life, so that with this kiss your love may be proven to all here in, in attendance. They hug one another and gently kiss, Renault taking her right hand and holding it firmly, putting it against his chest as they kiss. The two are wed, and the villagers start to drink brew from kegs set up in the grass by the trees and tables with cooked fowl and vegetables are about both left and right of the patch where they were married. It is a glorious little celebration. When Renault found out about Mirasami being with the elves, he went to her entirely on foot to propose to her. Braving the harsh north, he made it to treetop point and found her sleeping. When she woke, he had picked flowers only the elves knew about, and the elves were in on it after he had told them. She awoke very happy and ran to his arms. Then they rolled around on the ground and laid on their side and kissed. Marry me? Mirasami asked him. They agreed to leave the elves and go back to the, live a simple life in Drell, and for many long and happy y years together, life was like a dream for them, a singular vision of hope. Norman eventually made it to Ajuria Kree of Morvond. Weathering the terrible conditions to get there was a small price to pay for actual revenge. Obsidian killed their mother so long ago. Norman and Denon have different fathers, however. If Sidian was a priest in, in Murik and captured her as just another sacrifice, little did he know that she came from the witch hunter bloodline. It is a bloodline of magical non-mages that fight against the evils of the world. Norman enters the caverns, ever watchful. He creeps and steps slowly through the and down, stairs and stone pass and down and over. He spends the entire day combined, combing through, finding signs of someone being there, but finds no one. He finds the door on the floor and knows that it is protected by dwarven sorcery, but could not open it. He tried everything at his disposal, even searching for clues to open the door, but alas, nothing. He was sure something happened that made it where Obsidian had to escape. He was not aware that Obsidian could see possible future outcomes. He bashes a wall hangs his head low and slinks down thinking to himself he will never be able to avenge his mother. Samson walks the halls of the Ascadia barracks when a mysterious figure walks out of the shadows and holds his hand out saying, chain me up I am so tired of running. Samson is eating a piece of well cooked sweet bread. He throws it down and wipes his mouth asking, and who are you? The man curls his lips and says, obsidian, Samson first begins to draw his sword but doesn't. He says, wait here. He then walks toward where he came from earlier and on a table are some shackles. He grabs them and walks back to Obsidian. He locks him up and escorts him to White Tower. I could take you directly to the Tempest Guild and you could die now, but I am not without mercy even for scum like you. Much later he, put, he, he is put on trial secretly in White Tower and is sentenced to life in prison in, in Escadia. The dungeons will be his home now. He is no mage, and the book was his only power. Now lost. Years passed through and through he, and he never told the location of the tome, even with the guards treating him so badly. Norman and Denon eventually visited him in jail, and told him that they forgave him, that he showed honor. It has not changed the past, but it does change the future of us all. Norman said to Obsidian, 
through his bars. Danning grabs him through the, his cell and pressed him up against it, yelling out, Kill him now, Norman. We must. Norman shakes his head and puts his hand behind Danning's neck, forcing his head to his chest. The two depart. The cell is sad as if an innocent man was inside. The lone candle flickers outside of it. Chains can be heard being tampered with. What is choice? It is a test of fate. For if you know something and act, you are never truly without it. Obsidian lived in weakness and despair the rest of his days in that cell. One day Norman and Denon will visit their mother's grave in Murick and notice the dirt disturbed. They dig a bit to find Ethan's tome. Obsidian had buried it there. The two could not believe it, but there it was. It is getting late, Norman. We should be off soon, said Denon to his brother, sliding his hood over his head. Horns could be heard in the background very faintly. The wind whistled through the building cracks. Off to then, said Norman as he climbed into the horse's leather saddle. The two ride into the, into the city of Mirror. The desolation never seems to end here, but a warm day is ahead. King Hevar and Hydus are meeting in Escadia City to speak of the problem with the orcs taking over Fendragel and making it their own. There are people gathered from all over the world, including various mercenary captains. One sits up and says, We have dragons on our side. Havar waves his hand and says, So do the orcs. We must form a strategy that is stronger for the best of us all. The mercenary looks angrily upon him and then sits back down. If we are to win, we will need to aid the elves need the aid of the elves and their fey dragons. Surely they will come to our aid. I mean, these are orcs we are dealing with here, says King Hyde, slamming his hand down on the table and shaking everything on it. A glimmer of hope still remains, my friends. The elves are far more martial than they appear to be to us, utters a man sitting amongst the mercenaries against the wall near the window of the central tower they were in. Hevar then decrees we shall send our most talented scouts to see what strategy to open with would be best. Send word to the elves of the north and treetop point of our plight. If they don't already know, they have pacts with us to uphold. We will hold them to them at this time of strife. Hydus then paces once and walks toward the door and says to all, We shall wait it out. Time is on our side. The enemy is full of hubris and will not expect an attack. Tides march on, and the orcs freely rule in the newly formed Felgen capital city of Sortopa for another two and a half years. Their dragon whelps all about the keep outside, always watchful. They have been assembling a mercenary army of humans to aid in their numbers. Queen Leda sits on her th throne along with Hegabro. They cannot bear children and have relationship with that is almost purely out of ideal. Plus, Hegaro had a plan up his sleeves. Dane rules his orcs with an iron fist, but leaves the Felgans of, Sar of, of Soratopa to their own devices. They really want to play a place to call home. It is hard to believe this, but it is true, it seems. The siege engines have not been repaired because no one there knows how to fix them. Orcs have no need for such things. The Felgans still follow Hegavro, but they wish to have the Felgen relic returned to them and are getting wild and morale is low among them. The orcs would not dare threaten the massive Felgans just yet. In time, this alliance may be threatened. The amulet of Sora was now in the hands of Kriev. When Darkin turned on her, she was given a vision of the horrible acts he would commit in the wor world in the name of power. The elves, the, friend of, the friends of Sora at the time, gave the essence of the Fade Dragons to put in the amulet. Kriev gave his own es Dwarven essence. The result was quite unpredictable. Many thought she put, as the evil elves call it, the Fade Curse upon it on purpose. Kriev knew the truth. Now the dwarves are restored, yet far from their former glory. With such a powerful leader now, however, they may rise to the surface yet again. In fact, Kriev plans this over. 
as the dwarves hill and wipe their faces, putting on armor and going about in the deep. Brothers, hear me now. I, for one, cannot linger in the deep any longer. We must unite our former allies on the surface to this issue and march to the sanctuary of the elves. We have friends there. The elves age slowly. The ones I knew still linger there in their northern paradise. I would take us, it, it would take us nearly a day at most to reach them. Probably not even that long. <coughs> the dwarves cheer and start up a, a circular stairway of stone. In the lost lands of Celeron, the northeastmost lands of Escadia, frozen and never walked on for fear of weather, shape, and beast, they will march west. Even dwarves will not elect to pass over such so over so many vast mountains on the way they will travel the northern lands at, at their very highest braving the worst conditions to travel south into the barren riffleum the nations will cling to the old promises made by human and elf each nation is ruled over by a king there are three types of nations in Escadia: barren nations forest nations and mountain nations Orc, Felgen, and human bandits have unofficially ruled all of these na mountain nations except for the north. Kings of allied nations have been trying to stop them for what seems like a very long time now, but cannot. They do have a habit, however, of clinging, clinging to the mountains as far as the camps go. Bandits, bandit parties can be seen camped near any mountain range in the world almost. The forest nations have kings, but are actually protected and ruled over by the feral priest, priest of elven magic. They use elven secrets, but the elves not will not reveal all of their secrets to mankind. So Kriev and his army marched that day in the high places in the north, just over the tundra and beside the frozen North Sea. <coughs> Kriev wields his warhammer called the Fang. It is made of a rare metal called alcerite, which can repel or absorb magic and is strong enough to crush a dragon skull. Acerite is hard to fold and only the dwarves know how to do it. It has a blunt and large oval tip, large, larger than its middle piece. The tough skin of the dwarves' palm make it where they don't have to fashion leather or anything to absorb the impact of the weapon's blows. It's golden and of a simple design. It is his weapon, his only weapon. He has, he has it fashioned to his belt, his brown beard going down to his feet almost and hiding it from sight except when he puts it left foot forward, his, his left foot forward. Just then a massive beast comes awake out of the snow heap. The beast looks fat and hairy and has a white coat. It has a long nose with a downward horn and has sharp teeth. The dwarves numbering in the high hundreds well on the beast with their dwarven maces, which are more like axes. The beast is overcome in the snow, its blood defiling the wet blizzard. Food, make camp here, boys, Kriev says to, the, to his brothers, out of breath even though he did not fight, dry heaving in the cold. Dwarves are somewhat less resistant to all forms of extreme weather of the surface world. Even rain weakens their skin. The large company sets up high, high tents, and one that has dragging, that was dragging a small anvil, takes it from its bag, tongs and all. They start a fire with wooden rocks brought from the deep. The lava rocks still warm and red, as before. They march to the elves to rekindle an old friendship lost. It has been almost two years since the meeting in Escadia City, and not much has changed in the newly formed Orc and Felgen Empire. Dane still has his eye on his prize, High Post. Hagavro is busy with his sick perversions on the throne. All of Elimbarat is in a state of upheaval, with the refugees from Fendragle trickling into the small villages and hiding elsewhere. <coughs>